Welcome to Real Wealth Podcast. This week, I'm joined by Elliot Wise, serial entrepreneur, founder of Limitless University and owner of multiple businesses. Elliot has been all things entrepreneur since he was 13 years old and through the course of this interview, we talk about all of his experiences throughout business. There's some great gold nuggets for anyone that's looking to scale a business. Elliot is a truly inspirational entrepreneur, a great guy to spend some time with, and I was lucky enough he came up to Scotland and spent a few days with us. Great guy, great episode. Let's get into it. Welcome to the Real Wealth Podcast, Elliot Wangs. Thanks for joining me this week, and thanks for braving the weather to come up to Scotland and see us. I was actually baffled at just how different the weather is i mean i'm a southern southerner so i'm on the the, the south coast in brighton yeah <laughs> flew in hit scotland it was like bang turbulence rain clouds i mean i left sunny sunny brighton and yeah right here. however very pleasant so far and yeah i mean i'm not a massive proponent for scotland to be honest i spent 15 <laughs> years living abroad so you know i'm still trying to readjust to the weather where were you before I was in Azerbaijan for five years, oh, I was okay. in Texas for a few years. I used to travel with my, my old uh, work quite a lot, so it was it was kind of Russia, Russia for four years as well. That was weather was pretty grim there, but um, I think I think for me it's just you know it is what it is. It's Scotland, it's home, and you know we, we need to deal with it. But it was a bit sunnier the last time we seen each other in Marbella, to be fair. Um, so uh, thanks for coming again. Um, the one word that immediately springs to mind when uh, I've I've met Elliot Wise is serial entrepreneur and and what's more surprising about that is how young you got started mm -hmm. um so I, I think it's good to go back and get a bit of the backstory of how you started you know your entrepreneurial journey at such a young age and and what the drivers were and the influences around you at that time that kind of led you down that path so I come from a I think it has to start with parents more than anything so People think that I've come from, well, one, I wasn't spoon fed. I was yeah. not born into, I didn't, was born into a, wasn't born into a broke family, no. but we were very much working class. We lived in a, a council house, never wanted for food or anything like that. Yeah, it yeah. was like, we, we didn't have an abundance of money. We weren't driving around in Bentleys and Rolls Royces like a lot of people seem to think. I was always very creative and always very curious. And my parents never forced me. I have an Iranian wife now, and I've seen the culture that they've been brought up around in terms of like the pride in the family when you become a doctor, yeah, a doctor, yeah. right? And there's a much more cultural pressure, I would say, in different settings, even some English families, but mm. that would push a kid down a certain route. I was a very much a parent pleaser, yeah. So I wanted to make my parents happy. So had they indicated to me that you know a certain route would be better than another i probably would have pursued it however my parents were always along the lines of whatever you make makes you happy and they always let me figure out my own way for good or for bad and that's pretty rare it's very it's... rare right so but the, the problem is with the wrong personality type that can go really wrong. really wrong okay because then there's no structure there's no there's no drive luckily i was just ultra competitive don't know mm -hmm. where that came from i wanted to be fucking everyone yeah, I, I always wanted to do well. I didn't know what it, it, whatever it was. If it was ten pin bowling with my friends, you know, I would be the guy in the fucking bus on the way to the ten pin bowling, not speaking because I was so psyched up. I'd have to figure out who was good at ten pin bowling, psych <laughs> them out before. I'm like six, you know, like figuring yeah, like strategy like, before that, you, isn't that, it? that was there early yeah. on. Then sports and everything else, and I realized, okay, I'm a competitive guy. But then it came to the, the business of making money, and at secondary school, I was, I mean, I was blessed. I was born through the birth of the internet. We had, mm. remember, AOL dial-up. Um, most people watching this probably won't know what AOL like, dial-up is. Oh, and yeah. I, I was born through, yeah. I was that, born that when- That noise still rings in my head, that old dial-up. Your mum, are you on the internet? Because you couldn't <laughs> yeah. bring out when, the, when someone was yeah. on the internet because they keep the phone. Um, I was born through that that era. And when, you know, it wasn't even Google back then. It was like, ask Jeeves or yeah. something, but yeah. So search engines were new and websites were new. And what I've always been good at is is seeing patterns. And at that time, I realized that like I wasn't doing a paper round. I wasn't doing a paper round for anyone. I didn't like manual labor. I didn't want to actually physically work for to make money. Yeah. I always knew that. I was like, this this website thing is very new. I was like, everyone's going to need one. Everyone's going to need one. If they don't know it by now, they they will. And th this was 13. This was 13. I mean, that just, just to get to that thought process at 13 year, years old, the fact to start with that you were thinking about money, you know, and at that age, because, you know, I, 
I, I came from a similar background, very, yeah. very working class. And, you know, I think what what inherently is, is driven in you at that point is you realise there are people, even in your immediate community, that have things that you don't have. Mm-hmm. And, and that it, it leads to this sort of feeling of, you know, you're not enough or, or you want more. Or, so I kind of, I get where, where that side of it comes from, but I still think even at 13, I wasn't as driven to the point where I thought, right, I need to get out there and make money. Uh, uh, but that must just be something that, that's inherent to you. Cause it, it was the lifestyle that I wanted. Yeah. I knew that I could, I could I could do it. I think I realized I didn't really have many caps on me. This had possibly come from parents, so I didn't really have many lim- limiting beliefs. Yeah. So I never believed that people that you see were something special. Mm-hmm. A lot of people think that. Well, they see their idols or a yeah. very successful person. They're only fucking human. That's why I ever thought that everyone's human. So if someone else can do it, within reason, there's probably no reason why if I can't work my ass off, I can't do the same. And that inspired me to, that's what I said, I, I was like, right, okay, well, I'm going to get into this website stuff. I was a bit of a geek. Yeah. I, I like I like coding. and Understanding how things work. I like to understand how things work. And I love business. As I didn't know it then, but yeah. it was it was the complex game of business that I, I really was, was drew me in. I, mean, I bought back then because there wasn't YouTube or anything like mm. that. I remember I bought C++. Big book, JavaScript for dummies. I, I was it's like, so hard to learn anything by the so You think you get anything you need to know now? There's a YouTube video on it. Do you remember a Britannica encyclopedia? Yeah. Do you remember that? So yeah. like back then we didn't have Google. Like you could just type stuff in. You had to go. I remember my dad bought it. It was like three hundred quid or whatever it was. It was well, so there was a series of them. And you had to have quite a bit of money. <laughs> it was expensive, it. man, to, to to learn. So I was having to learn all this shit with books and and, and reading how to do it. But yeah. it gave me such a competitive advantage, and. uh yeah, that that's that's where that came from, and built my. F- I asked everyone that I knew that pe- it was ma- it was mainly friends of parents of friends, family friends. Do you want a website? Do you want a website? I'll do it cheap. This that, the other. Ended up getting a, a family friend that wanted a, a website made for their. Just company. just that first step you made though at that young age, mm-hmm. uh, we see this time and time again between the people that succeed and don't succeed coming through our training courses. It's been a- putting yourself out there and facing rejection. Is really fucking. It's difficult for an adult, but to be doing it at thirteen, you know, it, again, it just it just shows you you might be just wired a bit differently, or or maybe it was just the views of your parents that you know you don't have these limits on you. I'm definitely wired differently. Yeah. I've worked with enough people now, thousands of people, to realise that I wasn't wired the same as everyone else. Yeah. However, the things that I was wired differently with, a lot of which can actually be taught if you've already not if you've not had that same wiring. Yeah. There's actually patterns that you can implement and things that you can do to people that doesn't necessarily come naturally, but you can you can create that environment in someone's mind to be able mm-hmm. to execute and become successful. Yeah. As you guys teach, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be born. It can be learned. Yeah. It might be harder, but who gives a shit? This, that's something I also realize as well. It's like not everyone's the best at everything. Sure. And, I, it's, I, I mean, for me, I think it all starts from self-awareness understanding where your strengths and your weaknesses are and then going from there and so so many people don't even take time to properly assess themselves do you know what the main problem is that's one aspect of it but i think the biggest problem is people are fucking lazy they go oh my friend loses weight easier than i do so i'm not gonna bother you know oh my friend picked up maths faster than me so i probably won't bother because it's harder for me yeah motherfucker like if you want something in life you gotta work for it i realized that i was actually distinctively average academia through school but i'll just outwork them and i'll beat them you know i didn't always grow muscle the easiest in the gym i had mates that would just pile it on wouldn't have to do a lot but i'll do three extra hours this week then i wasn't afraid of the work if you want to get somewhere in life and also that's a massive advantage because people that have it come easy they tend to don't have they don't have the fire yeah but if you if you realize actually just got to apply yourself and stop blaming fucking everyone else for the fact that not where you want to be the victim mentality it's is such a hard thing to overcome with a lot of people, you know, and, and you can tell instantly, you know, I, I, it's almost a bit of a cliche, but any course we start is always going to start with mindset and trying to get people over these yeah. first hurdles, which has ultimately held them back for most of their lives to date. So if, if there isn't a mindset switch at the start, it's very unlikely to, you know, you can give everybody the best strategies in the world. But if they're not relentlessly going to pursue it and put the work in, put the effort, take the knockbacks, take the stress day in, day out of things not quite going the way you want, then, you know, it's just impossible to achieve anything significant in life. People don't want to try hard anymore. Yeah. Like, 
I ask this to people all the time. Um, when was the last time you tried your absolute best at something? Yeah. People go on about them. They're not succeeding. This and that. I'm like, did you give it everything? They didn't. Like, no. I mean, I, I, I must admit, I don't always give everything, my absolute everything. That's still good enough because most people are that, <laughs> that yeah. lazy. But if you said to someone, did you truly, truly pull out all the stops? Did you put it, give it everything? Did you do everything you possibly could to make anything work? They've not done it. So, and that's and on that, you'd be. If I urge anyone to just next time they try to pick something up, at least for themselves, give it everything. Yeah. Give a hundred, hundred percent, like properly go for it, and you'll be truly amazed at just how far you go. It's, you know, for me, it's becoming a bigger and bigger issue as the world develops. You know, we're, we're, we live in this world with instant dopamine hits. If you're bored. You know, you can stick on Netflix if you need a bit of self-fulfillment. You can stick something out on social media and get an instant dopamine hit. You know, it's, it's so easy for people to live their lives without really ever understanding what they're capable of, you know. That's why, you know, I always love listening to David Goggins, although yeah. he's an extreme motherfucker. <laughs> but, you know, just understanding the potential of the human body is just incredible. Most people will never have any clue about what they can achieve because they'll never put themselves out of discomfort. It's really easy to live life comfortably and achieve very little in life, you know? So it's, it's sad to see, but unfortunately, the way the world's going, especially with the advent of artificial intelligence, and we'll get into that, mm -hmm. you know, AI may solve even more of our problems going forward and, and literally you could be sitting on an island doing fuck all most of your life. Um, yet to see how that's going to go, but, you know, it's, it's a real risk for a lot of people. And and certainly when we talk about wealth creation and, and, and building wealth, most people just won't make the sacrifices they need to to get get to where they want to do, you know. So we kinda of went a little bit off track there. Apologies. But, but you are no, that's cool. That's all really good stuff. But you know, you're thirteen years old, you've started building websites, you put yourself out there, you've got, you know, presumably some customers on board, mm -hmm. you've figured out how to do it through the the archaic system of encyclopedias yeah, yeah, yeah. and the, the the virgin and web. Um, what's next? E-commerce. Yeah. So I learned how to build websites. I learned how to build, ca basically, they'll, they'll glorify catalogs mm. that I was basically uploading people's business cards for yeah. for their businesses, which was great. And I was getting, I mean, anywhere between 300 and 500 pound a website and I had a few clients a month. And, you know, for a 15-year-old, I was making good money. You know, it was good. I had an accountant. I was... In my mind, I was, I was doing really well. Then e-commerce became a thing, online shopping. For those that, that don't know what that is, it's you know, the, 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 the physically buying something online, having it sent out. So I started studying that. And it was actually a contact of uh, my dad's who was in lighting. And he, through my dad, messaged me saying, look, I, I can get hold of lighting. You can build shops, which I hadn't actually built one at that point. Yeah. Um, let's partner up. I get the best prices. Let's sell. So I don't know anything about lighting, but it doesn't matter. Let's give it a fucking go. I bought Google AdWords for dummies. Mm -hmm. I went out. I had a girlfriend at the time. I think it was this was when I was I was sixteen. I flew us out to Egypt and I read Google AdWords for dummies for the entire week at the side of the pool. I didn't spend yeah. any time with her. Didn't like that. Didn't last that relationship. Huh. Um, I spent the entire time learning Google AdWords for dummy. I had to scribble down this that, and the other. Came back as I write. Spent. Prior to that, that that was at the end of the summer holidays. That summer holidays was the transition between secondary school and sixth form college. Yep. And I spent an entire summer uploading catalogs. I had a pile of catalogs like this because I didn't have CDs back then. It wasn't CSVs yeah. and images. They get a little disc of um, of product images and then the catalogs with just like one line of description. Yeah. No prices. I had to work those out. I had to upload every single one. It was about 5,000 products I manually from these catalogs, typed them in, rewrote the descriptions, uploaded the attributes, drop downs, a whole lot. I was in a hole for the entire summer holidays and then went to, actually what happened was, I remember putting the, the site live and was like, gonna be rich. <laughs> it's like, no sales. Nobody comes. I was like, oh, the marketing. Yeah. Big component that I'd missed it. So then I, I was like, I was burnt out. So actually, I don't believe in burnout, I was tired. So then I was like, right, I need to refresh, clear my head, figure out the next steps to get this site moving. I was like, bought Google AdWords for dummies. This is back when Google AdWords was new. Yeah, it must, must have been super. It was super you know, new, man. So I went out, read the book, and you know, I I was good at reading books back then. I think I'd struggle to do that now because I learned differently. Came back and started running a Google AdWords campaign. 
ching, ching, ching. It was so cheap. Yeah. No one else was doing it. Okay, that started blowing. You know, I was doing quite quickly the equivalent of six figures a year revenue on a website when I was 17, 18 years old. It's incredible. I, I mean, for, first off, the work ethic of a 16 year old, you know, anybody that's got a 16 year old in their household, it's difficult to get them to load the dishwasher, never mind spend a whole summer working on a project. But, you know, it, it's the fact that you found something that you resonated with, that you found a passion in, and, and then it doesn't feel like work, right? It's, it's not work. And also, I saw the potential. Yeah. When I think people don't put the work in because they don't see what the opportunity could arise or they don't really believe in themselves. I was so motivated. Did I fucking enjoy banging in product details all summer all days while my mates were out having fun? Like it was that transition period where everyone was trying to say goodbye to each other from secondary school before they went off to different colleges. Yep. I missed out on that. I I saw a bigger solution because I, I knew what was ca I was capable of if I did this. Yeah. This e-commerce thing got it right. And then obviously that that took off in a, in a big way. I remember I, I had a born out Audi TT at <laughs> don't don't take the piss. Born Audi TT at sec, uh, college. I had the brand new iPhone that came out. I had like, money coming in. It was like, yeah, you know, it it was it was good. Y your peers must have noticed that. Oh right? yeah. yeah, it must have been like what? what well, I was I was at? every working every break that I had at college. I was on my laptop. Yeah, I was working on the business and people uh, that wasn't normal. I'd be up in the canteen and tucked in the corner taking business calls, sorting out yeah. stock making sure the wholesalers were, 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 were sorting out the, the deliveries, trying to organize credit accounts with suppliers who were like, who the fuck is this kid? He's younger than yeah. my, my kid, like come and ask me for a 60, 60 grand credit limit <laughs> yeah. on, on, a, on a 90 day term. I mean, that's incredible. I, but you know what, the interesting point about that is you are simultaneously going through the standard education system and higher education system at the university, yep. plus also doing this massive whirlwind apprenticeship and business. Mm -hmm. So you've seen both sides of it yeah. live hand in hand. And we talk a lot about that in the standard education system and how it kind of fails a lot of a lot of people because it's not teaching financial education. It's not teaching you how to structure your life in a way that's going to be fulfilling. Um and and it leaves huge gaps for people going in, into the, the workforce because ultimately that's what they need. They need people in the system driving the economy on minimal wage and, you know, not doing much with their, their life and their wealth. But you've seen both hands of the standard education and, and this. Where does the value lie for you with that? You know, because obviously you were still going through and, and putting all the work in on, on that university education whilst at the same time building this business and seeing the money come in. A lot of people, including some of the most famous names in the world, would have dropped out of university mm -hmm. and, and left, right? The mu there must be some second different. year I nearly dropped out yeah it was a I was I was only good money and I knew that it was it felt like it was a, a chain around my my neck yeah in that it was stopping me because I obviously had obligations it was social pressures all this kind of stuff when I was trying to build I had to I'd still had the web design company at the time and I was still building my, my lighting retail online well, retailer. and second year I nearly dropped out I had a bad breakup with a girlfriend in the first year of my or first semester of my second year, and I, I bonded my grades because I didn't revise. I was out doing too much partying, and, yeah. and, and I, I thought, you know what, this is just a joke. What am I doing? But I'm not a quitter. I, I'm a little bit of if I'm starting something, I, I, I'm you got to see it I got to sit through, and I thought I can do both. I'm just being lazy. If I don't try and do both, mm. I have the ability to do both because my work ethic is good enough. And I also wanted to sit here in the future and say, okay, if at least I write university or academia off, I've fucking gone through it before I start yeah. criticizing it because yeah. so many people bash academia and haven't actually yeah. done it. So it's a very valid question, a very good point. The value that university brings, which people don't understand, is that there's very few, I can't think of any really, other opportunities where set of peers have no responsibilities outside of, obviously I did, but outside of themselves yep all at the same age all with similar desires and wants in life which brings a really unique community of people and which actually teaches you quite a lot in terms of socializing and, and yep. growing now there's two things i always advise people to do because i say don't completely write academia for universities complete waste of time unless you need to mm -hmm. go to one of the the core subjects like medicine uh, engineering law yeah outside of that it's a complete waste of time in 21st century in my opinion but it does bring with it a tremendous amount of social skill increase and the ability to navigate a situation where you don't have parents or support 
you're a bit more independent. It's a it's a gateway to growing up, mm. which I think is super important. That if we take that out entirely, it'll be a problem as well. Yeah, but you shouldn't be paying university fees and academic fees for that experience. So, two things you can do: one, you can get involved in a mentorship or a community of people that are similarly minded that gives you the academia and still brings that support, but you're learning something that's in line with what. Exactly. I know Limitless does that I know Rude Rude does that and that's a big part of what we promote is the network it brings a social aspect yeah 100%. the other element if you can if you want to do it is if you want to continue to learn on your own path I would advise if you're a young kid 18 to early 20s and you want to go back to you want to go to university for the social side yep continue to pursue your your side hustle even if that's working for another company or building your own business but go and live in a university community or actually try and get in with halls with people that are going to university you just don't have to turn up to the lectures yeah right so you can still do your own thing but you're around the the network yeah so you can still get the best of both worlds mm -hmm. and that's what i would advise yeah 100 i mean that sounds like really sage advice um uh, yeah I, I i mean i've spoke a lot about my my kind of views on university and higher education and you know i, I really don't disagree with you you know i think that there, there are inherently some benefits of doing it mm -hmm. um but for me, the, the true education didn't come until I was out of university. Where do you think personally that the education system started failing? Um, I'd, I'd say from the start, you know, I, I don't think, you know, okay, there's, there's not much happening in the early years of primary school, but, you know, I think they need to be teaching um, financial literacy, the basics of understanding what money is and, and how it works f from an early age. You know, I mean, I, I certainly plan to do that when my kids are a bit young at the moment, but... You know, I, I just, it shocks me that people can go through that full education system and come out the other end and they don't have the skills for the two most fundamental things in life that will make you or define the happiness in your life. So your, your ability to manage money and, and money isn't everything. It doesn't make you happy, but, you know, Fucking having nice. a serious lack of it can, can be can be a major yeah. issue. And, and the other one is having a, the first clue about how to pick someone who you're going to spend the rest of your life with because if you don't get that right you're going to have a fucking miserable life speaking as someone who's gone through divorce you know learning the skills of how to pick the right relationship is is, is massively important and, and you're just left to it you know and I, I understand why those things are not important to the government and, and how it feeds the economy and the system and you know but for me it's something that, that you need to get educated on sooner or later i mean i went through accountancy and finance at university I then went to work in finance for a big oil and gas company and I got to my late 20s and I still didn't have the first fucking clue about managing my own money, mm -hmm. managing my own wealth and, you know, even understanding truly that there was this option of entrepreneurship, you know, it was, you know, similar working class background but zero entrepreneurship going on around me, you know, everybody had a job, you know, my, my parents were much more conservative and they were like, you know, mm -hmm. You need to go to university, you need to get a good job. Good jobs were either accountants, lawyers, or, or um, doctors. My grades weren't good enough for lawyers or doctors, so I was an accountant. I went and became a chartered accountant. It was just the path that was, yeah. was put in front of me, you know. And uh, it took us to the early 30s to get on board with entrepreneurship, the mindset shift that we can take control of our own life and, you know, start to build our own business rather than someone else's. You know, I mean, we have to lead by example. So I deploy a tremendous amount of empathy for people that are in that position because it's not necessarily their fault. Everything is your fault, but the system is set up in a way that that doesn't become a real option and it's mm -hmm. not even known. So what you have to remember is the reason I asked you about when education, you thought education failed. I think education probably has failed in the last, I would say, 40, 30 to 40 years properly because before our parents' generation and possibly the generation before that, post-Second World War, yeah. There was a period where when you did actually go through academia and you got a degree, there was a correlation between your wage increase and career benefits that were profound. Yep. There was actually a direct correlation. Whether or not it was from the education itself, it didn't matter. The fact that you have it, had a degree and went and did traditional or the standard route massively effective. really helped, right? So in that system, you were getting value from the money and the time you were investing. So there is a less of a failure there. Granted, the subjects maybe... Mm. not great but you actually doing it regardless of the reason actually helped to benefit yeah. you now the advice that we're getting from generations above us were the people that experienced that so it's 
unfair to to say to a lot of people that don't necessarily get it because they've had pressures from people that now don't understand how it works now. Yeah. It, it's broken now. They, they didn't live through that. They had a very different experience. They got great pensions. They bought houses cheap. They benefited from the, the economy absolutely flourishing. They listened to the, the government and were rewarded unbelievably so for it. So we're in a really weird time right now, yeah. you and I especially, where we've had our older generations had a completely different experience of the government and the system yeah. than we are going to have and ultimately the generations after us are going to have, which is going to be guys like us now having to educate people like, that's not the case anymore. Yeah, This isn't how it is. And, and it's a wake-up call. And that's not something, you know, it's, it's not something that I, I'd look back and say to my parents, you know, you shouldn't have pushed me this or mm-hmm. that. You know, I'm, I'm very appreciative of, of what, what they did for me. But uh, as you say, in their generation, there was no way they could ever afford to go to university. It wasn't an option for them. My mum was like one of seven. Uh, and my dad was one of four and uh, you know they, they they didn't come from the sort of background where university was an option so understandably they wanted that for their, their mm-hmm. children you know so you get where they're coming from but it's about understanding the right approach for the, the time now and actually it's very difficult to understand what the right approach is for our time now given that there is another world massive shift coming with artificial intelligence and you know we, we spoke about it in a previous podcast of this point of, of singularity where AI becomes self-aware and various different views over what way that could go. But the fact is, in the not-too-distant future, there is a singularity coming where the way the world is will massively change. And, you know, it's within my children's generation, you know, they're like three and one. So by the time they're an adult, the world could be a completely different place. The world will be a different place, but what can you do? You can wake the fuck up. Yeah. Well, that's I, it. that's, it's another point that I was going to talk about, actually, because, you know, I was in Marbella at the Entrepreneur Summit that, that you guys put on, the Hybrid Entrepreneur Summit, really enjoyed it. And I enjoyed your chat. Um, your talk was on artificial intelligence. Yeah. And, you know, it makes a lot of sense to me that you were talking about that because, you know, it, we are chatting about it every single day, just like, you know, <laughs> and and within the framework of your business, it's impacting it now. You know, it's, it's already heavily underway with you know i I know you've got an outsourcing business you've got marketing agency you've you've got limitless obviously with with the entrepreneur mentorship but huge effects on artificial intelligence you know we talk about you know the singularity and and this you've got the doom mongers that say oh the world's gonna fall in in flames to artificial intelligence but the more pragmatic people are saying right it's here Mm -hmm. what are we going to do with it in the short term to make sure that we don't fall behind and it's exactly the approach you took with the internet at the start and and looking at the opportunity there of you need to get on board and you need to get on board quickly you know so that's why i really appreciated your, your your talk on artificial intelligence but what do you think is the sort of short term focus and benefit from ai uh from from a business perspective ai is a new lever for any business or anyone that yeah. Is going to give them a huge arbitrage when i say arbitrage it's in a it's in a period in which there's a huge advantage to take be had on you knowing something that someone else doesn't know hmm. um and throughout history if you look at if you go back through all history the internet was a great example but before that you had industrialization you had like yeah. uh, manufacturing agriculture was a huge part when people that jumped on the technologies early absolutely dominated and we internally talk about it like cyborging yourself yeah so in a way to think about it is you're competing against if you're not using artificial intelligence people that are effectively cyborgs they have got so much more output quality ability than you do as a mere human without artificial intelligence it's a new level within a business which means that we're honestly living through one of the most exciting periods to watch because artificial intelligence just as a really basic way of explaining it let's say that it can increase the output of one person by a thousand x mm. maybe even a hundred x that means a small business of say 10 people 15 people could have the output of 1500 yeah right but focused with one mind which makes it even more powerful because there's less communication lag there's less politics and all the other issues that arise so what we're going to see and we're going to live through this very soon, mm-hmm. is small outfits destroying massive, massive companies, yeah. absolutely eating them alive. Their margins are better. Their speed at which they can do things are better. Everything is faster. Incorporating new technologies, the quality will be better. That, that's a different world. You know, it, it really is when, when you compare it to these big organizations, big machines, it's actually harder for them to adapt 
to the times. They can't. You know? They can't. So I'd say can't. I don't like that word. They're going to struggle more mm. because, like you say, for one, people don't want to be put out of their position. So there'll be a tremendous amount of resistance to incorporating any new technology. Yeah. There's always bigger democracy, which means board meetings have to happen. Systems have to change. There's so much slow pace with big companies, but before it wasn't a problem because they were so big, the little guys couldn't catch up. Yeah, they could they could move and pivot fast enough. But now speed is very key. Mm. But these guys can have huge output, and the margins are, are so much better because they've they've got so much less staff. Yeah, so much less overhead. It, yeah. It's gonna be crazy. So for people that are looking into it, just start studying it. Yeah, do basic base. I mean, I did I did a really basic course, for example. Mm -hmm that covered all the basic AIs just to get your head around how it could be be used. And, and the fun thing is, is because it's uncharted territory, your ability to innovate how you can use it could uh, massively make you, yeah. you can make generational wealth. Yep. If you just come up with a slightly different angle and get, get creative, you know, and then, you know, the only way to do that is to understand the breadth and depth of what's available out there just now. And there's literally thousands of new tools coming out all the time. So it's, it's a big endeavor to get on board with it, but it's so essential. You know, I, I I listened to Mo, Mo Goddard talking uh, recently and he, he wrote a book called Scary Smart where he talks about the potential of AI in, in the future. And he said that, yes, lo long term we don't know. We just don't. There are some inevitables, but long term we don't know. But what we do know is, you know, that there isn't going to be this instant world revelation where <laughs> AI takes over everybody's job. The next three to five years is more like, one person doing a hundred people's job with with the use of artificial intelligence as you say kind of cyborging a, an individual that's coming and and it's a scary place to be if you're one of the guys that is not getting on board with ai because you're going to be left in the dust absolutely alive absolutely alive and and when you come when it comes down to decisions in life and this is the, this is the same applies to people that might have a job they're thinking about going out on their own or like people that might be on the fence about getting into property or whatever Look at the opportunity cost of everything, right? You can sit there and be a pessimist and talk about that AI could become a singularity and, and render humans irrelevant. Fine. Yeah. If I go down that route, I'm 100% going to do nothing and 100% going to fail. Mm -hmm. The alternative, the only other logical alternative is, okay, what can I do? Yeah. What's my best case? Even if it doesn't work out, i am still got some chance of making it work. So I'll go 100% on that. Yeah. Otherwise, so just go in. <laughs> there's there's no, no point in stressing out about things you can't control. No. You know, I, so, I always have that, that chat with my missus, you know, she's like, why aren't you stressed about this? I'm like, well, if I can't control it, I'm not going to get stressed about it because that is pointless. Yep. You know? Um, but, you know, for me, it's like um, th things are going to move super fast. What what we see is conversations of people telling themselves, yeah, but yeah, artificial intelligence is never going to be able to do my job. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, it's the natural go-to response from people and it's just so incredibly fucking naive, you know, that capabilities of this thing in the long term are, are endless, you know. Laurie had said to me uh, a couple of weeks ago, he's like, yeah, but everybody's still going to need a roof over their head. So, you know, we're good and by let was like, well, how are they going to pay for it if everybody's job has been eradicated by artificial intelligence or the mass populations? You know, this is another point that we've got I was making is, you know, we're not talking, you know, 20, 30 years down the line, we're, we're talking much more short term where people are going to rapidly be displaced by artificial intelligence and it's like the government doesn't have a plan. You know, unless they are massively heavily taxing the AI companies in the short term, how are they going to fund all these unemployed people at the other end? And we may say, okay, we go back to manufacturing age, there was a lot of people that were displaced as, as things got mechanised and we still figure that out. That, that becomes more challenging with the depth and breadth of artificial intelligence because there's not one sector, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a very, very interesting time in that we have no clue what's going to actually happen. No. And there is a huge potential here for people that don't get on it and don't actually make something of themselves now could potentially find themselves in a position where they can never get on top. Yeah. And that's just... To be honest, though, that's quite reflective of how it is now. You have mm -hmm. the majority of people working class that are often being fed by the government anyway. Yeah. I think what you'll find is there'll just be a, a, a bigger percentage of people that get shunted down from the middle to the bottom. We've never seen a rate of pace of differential than what we're going to see no, with artificial intelligence. Though, and that, that's where the gaps are going to get bigger. I mean, we already talk about the wealth gap just now having got massively bigger in the last 40 years. You know, Code, you, you just need to look at the, it, the, but... the pay gap between an average employee and a CEO over the last 
40 years and there was actually a graph that showed it year by year and you just see it going like this you know um those those gaps are only going to get bigger as the, the pace and acceleration of progress does um scary time but also massive opportunity and, and this is the point it's like an action is is not gonna is a guaranteed way to fail. So, so you know, take take the action and, and get involved. Um, so, I I hadn't expected to go into the AI chat so much, but it just naturally went there to take a step back. Um, just to finish off your kind of startup story, mm-hmm. you you created this seven figure uh, lighting business. Um, I understand that failed at some point. Mm-hmm. Um, so tell me a little bit about what happened there and, and what the lessons were and obviously you moved on from that to build some hugely successful businesses but there must have been some some hard lessons there oh massively hard lessons but it's probably the best thing that ever happened to me so I built a very successful lighting business to the point at which we were selling so much and buying from wholesalers in the UK I decided that I wanted to start getting better prices because we had good buying power yeah. I flew my ass out to Shenzhen China southeast of China on my own, didn't speak yeah. the language, found an apartment, yeah. was in hotels for a month to start with to try and before because no one would rent out to a white. They call me Guelo, white devil. Got a lot of racism. Yeah, well. yeah, yeah. No one spoke English. Locked myself in a room trying to learn Mandarin mm. so I could actually get by. Thought it was going to be easy, but <laughs> hard. Um, then started visiting factories while I was there. Getting by, I managed to find a driver to take me around. I was like, getting trains to the factories and negotiating better lighting deals. Yeah. And ended up getting a few good suppliers, put my first, I think, quarter of a million pound order in, had them packed up. Uh, that was getting made when I was there, had loads of labels made, went to all the printing factories, sorted all that out, um, and flew back. All the stuff arrived. We, we were doing well. Like, we did really well. I think my margins went from like 30% to 70%. When I wow. did that, it was like, good. Okay, the money's coming now. And we had stock, got a new warehouse. So things were flying. I was in business with someone that was. About 12 years older than me. I was still very young at this point. I think it was when it was going this well, it was, I was about 23. Yep. Um, I had, what I have, a Bentley, you know, four bed house, detached house. That was half a million pound. I was doing well, just to give people a bit of perspective. Yep. Range Rover. Okay. The- I was uh, financially doing really well. And the reason I say this is because the next bit gets really hard. I put too much trust in other people. So I take accountability for everything that happened. Yeah. Because it wouldn't happen now. So therefore, it was in my control. I was naive and inexperienced and I allowed too much trust in people around me through naivety and probably the fact that I thought I was younger and you know, took my eye off the ball with certain things. Yeah. Didn't check the bank balances properly, didn't check the accounts properly and all of a sudden, I won't go into massive details, but um, ended up getting stung by the business partner. Uh, money was a hole created. Like the, the company yeah. should have been killing it. Things were being taken out, did all add up and then all of a sudden... All is well being fulfilled. I was like, hang on a minute, I'm starting to get some negative reviews coming through because I was monitoring all the digital stuff. I yep. really wasn't paying attention to the financial side, mm-hmm. the wholesale, because that wasn't my bag of tricks. I didn't know, I didn't have the contacts, right? And that was a mistake. And then I was just being given information from business partner that I just took to be true. Right. And uh, that obviously is a huge issue because there was nothing set up to quality check or double check anything that he was doing and obviously when it comes down to the money and purchasing that's huge i just put my trust in it massively yeah then all of a sudden we got so many chargebacks coming through for customers that were getting fulfilled that then the payment providers started blocking us so you know like when you have a you're selling something online you have like a a merchant that handles the the payment transactions of a world pay all these other things so they're like a middleman between the bank and your payment provider and then they started blocking us. And I was like, fucking hell, what's going on? Didn't really realize I was going to come on, sorry, sure. There was money left the company. They weren't buying stock. It wasn't fulfilling orders. And, and ultimately, the company went under. Um, it nearly bankrupt me. I mean, I, I lost everything. I remember crying in the garden, you know, like, it, this is me at 23, thinking fucking yeah. my world was over. Um, to, to expect to have all those skills at 23, though, you know, like, I can take people. Okay, like, you asked about lessons. Arrogance, mm-hmm. one believe that I was I was untouchable at that point I hadn't had any failures mm. I couldn't do anything wrong everything I touched turned to gold you know yeah. I think I was a little bit complacent on that front um a bit of arrogant on that front believe that you know I was I was too good <laughs> mm. you know trust trust is great and you need to have it in a business but with any business you go into you need to have everything 
with a plan B, everything written in black and white, everything contracted and everything double checked, yeah. especially when it comes to money. Never take your after money ever. Big lesson. Check the bank balance. Question everything. Have other people question things for you. Have an accountancy team and then there's someone else that checks their accountancy. Yep. Double check everything. So just put, just two. And these things were so, and I'm so, so grateful that this happened to me early on mm -hmm. because this was only seven figures. Yeah. I will build nine figures and plus businesses now in the future. If I hadn't had those lessons, I still had that arrogance and didn't have those double checks. And this happened to me later on when I've got kids, I've got a wife, I've got hundreds of stars. I might watch CDS game. Oh, if I that, didn't, right? I, I could have still got to that point without having had those lessons and not putting those checks in yeah. place. Imagine that now, the impact that, the negative impact that I wouldn't have just on me, mm. but for everyone. So whenever you get into business, doesn't matter how close you are to that person, always treat it as business, not as with, with emotion. And that's, yeah. it's, it's not having a go or, or, or that's not a reflection on the person you're in business with, it's just business. Because you always have to cover your ass because you never know what's going to crop up. I mean, it's so it's so difficult to find a, a, a partnership arrangement that that is going to last the test of time, and you know uh, you're going to have the the right skill dynamics between the two of you at work, or you know it, it's a really tough thing to do. I mean, we've been very lucky. It, ours happened organically. It wasn't mm -hmm. ever something that intended. Laurie and I just started doing a bit of work together, and we realised after a little bit of time. Right, we're better. Just we're achieving way more together than we are doing our separate things. So let's just bend all that and do this. Uh, and then Connor kind of came in a little bit later with this really nice balance between the two of us. Laurie's quite extreme and out there, and I'm quite analytical and systems orientated and introverted. And Connor's just got this really nice balance between us. But that all happened very organically. If if I was out there looking for a, a joint venture partner or, or whatever, I can't imagine how difficult it would have been. You know, I talked before about the fact that one of my closest mates wanted to do a, a property joint venture with me. It was mm -hmm. that. And I said no. And it's it's one of the best decisions I've made because we're so similar. You know, our, our, our values are very similar. Our skills are very similar. That there'd be no benefit to it. We'd have just been sat there agreeing with each other all the time, and it would it, it, that's not productive towards building something that's going to last. So, yeah, I'd be lucky on that front, but I also understand from from being in the process and seeing other people, super difficult to get a, a business partner that you can trust inherently. Obviously, you do still need to make sure everybody's looked after in the right way. You know, Laurie and I took time last year to do our shareholders agreements and all that. We hadn't done that. Bit of a mistake on our side, but. You know, we we we've been working closely for a while, but that's all kind of buttoned down now. I'm quite big on systems and processes anyway, so I like that we've got financial reviews monthly. You know, we 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 know where we're at with, particularly the building company, because that's a bit more complicated than than all of the other stuff. Um, but you know, it's it's just about keeping everybody on the same page and 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 having that open, transparent discussion. You know, it. I can I I feel like I get an, an instant feel for someone whether or not there's an over self interest in them. Yeah. And we we've had this we had this very discussion about a, a member of staff that came in that's not worked out, and I knew from day one there was just wait like just in the door you could feel the self interest oozing in the room, and I'm like that that's just never going to work, you know. It's it's not how I'd want a partner, but definitely you know not staff either, you know. It, it, there needs to be this sort of collective fit, I think. Um, and, and that's obviously something that you're very good at as well as building a team around you and, and generally with building a really strong network around you. You know, I, I can see that from the Hybrid Entrepreneur Summit, but also a lot of, a lot of your content online that network's been massive for you. So, uh, you know, have you got any tips, tricks? Uh, you know, how do you get good at that sort of thing of, of building a really solid team of people around you that are helping you towards it and people that are not going to just suck the life out of the room be the person that you want to attract yeah number one yeah leaders like you're running a business you are the leader you're the guy that should be if you're doing it in my opinion correctly in the fucking trenches with 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 your family mm. as i call them the family your, your, yeah. your teammates all shoveling fucking mud out of that trench or we as we like to say we're, we're on a snow plow steam train yeah and we're all in the front carriage shoveling coal together there's you have to set the standard you have to be the person you want to attract and that has to seep out from you yeah. 
what I love about life is that when you take accountability for everything, you can control everything. Yeah. And everything's your fault, whether it's good or bad, which is fucking brilliant. And the network that you have around you, whether it be your employees or just your net, your general network in a social environment, all this comes from you. Mm -hmm. So if you are conversely, it'd be a really scary world if you were just a victim of everything because to have right. no control over anything would I know it's the worst thing. You know, we said about game theory earlier. Yeah. And you can pick and choose which which avenue you walk down. Yeah. Obviously, there's a reason I walked down that one. That's a damn sight better outlook for me. And I can control both of them. Yeah. Exactly. So to build a team that's like, I'm blessed. Yeah. I'm truly blessed. The people I have around me it hasn't come from accident and it's not through luck. It has come from the fact that I have expressed my vision and I think if you really want to truly be a good leader and you want to have good people around you you have to let people know where they're going and you have to sell them on the ride yeah but you have to truly believe it too so everyone knows where I'm going what I'm doing and now it's what we're doing and where we're going and we're all doing it together and we're all contributing and we all input and it's a brilliant hard but brilliant journey yeah and that has to come from me to start with and then that seeps through the layers of any organization, like I said, whether that be an actual commercial business or just your social network. Um, there is always a hierarchy, but it shouldn't feel like it. No. Uh, I think that's the way it works. But quickly to go back to what you were talking about, about management approaches, there's two different ways of doing this. So your culture of your business is very in line with mine, where you're creating a team environment where everyone's contributing together and you're pulling as one. Yeah. Now, the person that came on that was probably self-interest would actually work in a, the opposite management style in which you just motivate through bonus-related pay, through self-interest, and there's no real camaraderie, but they'll execute because they're trying to look after themselves. That's great. And that's a really easy system to scale because if everyone's running on bonuses and commission structures and all they need to do is turn up and do their job, yeah. then that will work. And it's very good. Probably someone like yourself would find that easy because it's systemizable, it's quantifiable, it's trackable. You know, you, you just manipulate through incentive structures, through pay, and that's it, done. This other one, this one where you're building culture, you're building team, you're building trust, you're building love, mm. all these things within an organization is very difficult because it has to come through emotion, it has to come through care. You actually have to turn up for your team. Yeah. They have to turn up for you. But the brilliant thing about this is, and this is why this will always be this one, is that, there's a level of discretionary effort that you don't get with this. And what I mean by discretionary effort is, is in this environment where everyone's performance rate of pay, they will do the bare minimum to get the maximum output. Absolutely. In this one, everyone will hit the limit of what's required and they carry on going. Mm. And if you look at any, any, any history, you talked about AI, you talked about the internet, you talked about all these things, they're massive economic shifts. They will affect every single business. One way you've got nobody turning up at the weekend because some shit's hit the fan or some new technologies come in and that needs to be yeah. adopted and you know your competition's fucking destroying you they don't care this team they're in they're working through the night they're doing everything they possibly can they're spending their weekends learning the new stuff making sure that you're okay they're phoning you up making sure that's okay they're taking a month's deduction of wages they're not taking it so you can keep mm -hmm. the company afloat they're there like they're supporting you emotionally physically financially they're on board 100% and you know what even if they both were making the same amount of money, which one would you rather be in? Oh, yeah, 100%. Good. It goes without saying that, you know, I've spent time in the corporate world, mm -hmm. and that, that's all it is, you know, and, and you can see how the system falls down really quickly when things start to go the wrong way, you know? It's just and, fucking you know, hard to do the other thing. Yeah, it is. It is, but, you know, it, it comes from, as you say, the, the values of the founder, and, and if you have those strong values and, and you see it as a family, then you know, you're going to attract people to it. And, and the people that aren't attracted by that are going to leave pretty quickly. And, you know, I th I, I, I'd like to say that we're much more on this side of things than the, than the corporate machine stuff, you know. 100% I've been here and you know, I've seen what you're like. I can truly, I can, yeah. I, can, I can testify to the fact that you guys are a great family. You care about your clients, everything that you guys are doing. That's why I ultimately wanted to work with you guys because I yeah. saw just, and that's why we're here. Mm -hmm. I said this to Connie yesterday in the nice way possible. You know, we, we have people that we work with and we see like that they have similar core values to us and that's why we make the effort to to come and meet you. And I'm like, we, we've been amazed at just how well you guys have done, how well you guys are going to do. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of, there's a very bright future yeah. for, for, for you. It's, it's a big thing for us, you know, as well to be within a network of successful entrepreneurs that are doing great things and that are really trying to, you know, 
move things forward because you know as i say where are we just now we're in grangemouth industrial town in the middle of scotland between edinburgh and glasgow we're not even in a major city you know we're not surrounded we're not in silicon valley here you know we're not surrounded by a lot of aspiring entrepreneurs and and, and people doing really game-changing things and for us we need to reach out to find those those networks and groups and you know that's where it really uh, hits home with limitless and what you guys are doing because you know the network is just so incredibly important and and trying to get those discussions with the right people where you know it's going to help move your business forward exponentially and maybe there's other areas where they can help you can help them and you know it's just it, it, it feeds the whole thing you know and uh, we've been struggling with that till till now things are starting to to change in the last year thankfully but network's been sort of a big focus for us over the last little while mm -hmm. you know i mean you can orchestrate a good network by physically going out and finding it but mm -hmm. once again if you take the accountability onto yourself yeah i learned a big lesson um quickly tell a story but i my wife was finishing had a medical degree and we lived in stoke on trent for four years Anyone that lives in Stoke and Trent knows what it's like. It's not the, the most salubrious place in the world. It's certainly probably one of the most anti-entrepreneurial places ever. I mean, there is yeah. no there's no entrepreneurship. There's no commerce anymore. When all the uh, potteries and everything closed down there, there's, it, there's huge poverty. And from a, from an entrepreneur's perspective, I was buying up uh, rentals. I still got quite a few up there. Yeah. Uh, HMOs for, for student lets in Stoke. I was running my companies. I was doing really well. And I, I was obviously, I, I had a Bentley and a, one of my, one of the, had the rentals that I bought on like a really bad street. Like I was yeah. hit out like a sore thumb there. So just put it, the reason I'm making that point is that there was no one there. Yeah. And I started training at a, a gym called Strength Asylum, which is a well-known gym, um, but you know, there was nobody really coming. Funny enough, a good friend of mine, Jordan Peters, who was a big bodybuilder, had a big network of people. Um, and I helped him build out his subscription-based website. It was an education platform for very serious bodybuilders. Yeah. He, we were at the real beginning end of, of like subscription based uh, platforms and all that kind of stuff. And he invested a lot of money into videographers to come up. And I started training with him at the gym. Mm -hmm. And Eddie Hall was at the gym at the time as well. Oh, well. right. So we, we had this little, there was a, a couple of us in there that were, were relatively well known. Mm -hmm. Jordan started pumping out content. Eddie Hall started pumping out about content. We were training together. And then all of a sudden, people started to come train with us. Mm -hmm. Right. And these were big names for the fitness industry that started coming and people started coming to see Eddie Hall. All of a sudden, the gym's packed. People started moving to Stoke. By the time we finished it, I trained yeah. with Jordan for about a year. This gym was fucking in, like, just, it was heaving with people in that yeah. industry. We became the magnet. Mm -hmm. You could do the same thing here. You've yeah. got enough stuff where people want to come to you because you're setting the standard. People mm -hmm. want to be around you. Like I said, be the person you want to attract. Yeah, and it's about accountability. Okay, and, you know, it's important to say, you know, there's no, there's never any excuses here. You know, we, we're always saying, right, this is what it is and here's the action we're going to take to rectify it, you know, and, and, and that's what what we've been working on over the last year. But, you know, we're building our own network. That's well, been a, sort of a fundamental change in our business in the last six months as we realised we need to stop transactionally training people mm -hmm. on, a, on a monthly cycle and start building a network and retaining clients. And that changed the game for us. And, and, it, and it's obvious now but you don't know what you don't know, uh, you know, and until we made that change, it, it, it genuinely did change the game. But, you know, just one one small change to, to how the same product is provided and supported um, has, has massively changed that business, you know. Um, so networking has just been, been huge there. Um, you, you briefly mentioned the HMOs, the properties mm -hmm. in Stoke. Um, you know, I, I can see you've got properties marketing agency outsourcing aesthetics business with your wife as yeah. well i read um and then limitless there's a lot of diversity going on there um it i take it that's intentional and if so you know what is the value was that learning from the, the failure of of your your one big lighting business early on that you said okay well i need, I need to have fingers in a few different pies and you know, what's the intention behind the diversity and also how, how do you manage it? You know, there must be a lot of ball spinning or plate spinning. You know. So to be honest with you, I fucking love business. Yeah. So I am a bit of a shiny object freak. Like when a new business opportunity comes up, I found it very difficult to say no. Yeah. And I probably have taken on more than I should have done to be optimal. Mm -hmm. However, when you truly love something in life, it's yeah. like if you love certain foods, 
do you really want to be walking around at 3% body fat or you actually enjoy yourself a little bit? Yeah. Like, I'm the same with business. I, I realize that if I really love something, even if it's not necessarily optimal in terms of the money output, it's not about the money. Mm. You know, I can still be very wealthy. And the framework that I like to look at is like, when you get to like retirement age, what decision would you have made? Would You can have a chat with yourself at that age. Yeah. Would you have, speaking to that person, made the decision to be optimal or be happy but still do well? Like, yeah. even if it wasn't quite as much. And nine times out of 10, your, your retired self would say, look, you should just have a bit more fun. Like, those, those little mindset, I, I call them little mindset hacks, really fucking valuable. You know, you, you kind of mentioned that in passing there, but, you know, I, I, there was one from Peter Tea recently about the kids are running about mental destroying the place toddlers and and he said just try and flip your mindset and say look you know imagine 80 year old you and and this is the only time that you get to come back and spend the day with your kids and see them at this age yeah. again and and just bring yourself to more presence and more gratitude and you know those, those things are massively powerful because too many of us get lost in the day to day right mm -hmm. and i think that's so important so for me i optimize yes i optimize for growth but also happiness mm there's a caveat that there's a constraint to my growth. It's like, I have to enjoy the journey. Yeah. That doesn't necessarily mean that everything is easy. It mm. just means I enjoy it. And yes, because of that, I probably took on more businesses than possibly I should have done. And it's taken me a long time to get them to a point where I've delegated a lot of it out that I don't have to focus on it. Yeah. The main goal now is limitless. The limitless community and what we're building is going to have so much impact that for me, money is no longer really, it's still a motivator, but not as big as it was. That was the motivator for yeah. me. I want to create something special. And there's a whole healthcare uh, element being incorporated to Limitless. So I can and will help hundreds of thousands, not millions of people become financially freer mm -hmm. and healthier and live longer and happier. Yeah, That's my impact and that's my goal. So focus has now become everything. Mm -hmm. I've attached myself to it and I want to do that for the rest of my life. I mean, Limitless is incredible insofar as there's there's a real variety of businesses that you can support mm -hmm. and grow, right? And and that that's the thing that immediately struck me is you have the opportunity to have impact over multiple sectors and 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 you know really make a difference to people. So that that them. satisfies my shiny object syndrome. Yeah. So I get to exactly. work with all these different industries within one. So it, I mean, it it was a clever move, chess move, to unify my and become more clear on the, the end goal to shoot a one target with still having all of the fun yeah. variety incorporated into the one business, mm. which I love, but it stopped me trying to shoot at multiple targets at the same time. I'm shooting at one, but it's all united. It's, I'm uniting them all under one umbrella, yeah. which is fucking brilliant for me. Yeah. It's the best thing since sliced bread. I fucking, I'm the happiest I've ever been. I'm blessed. I'm, I'm truly wake up every single day happy. I mean, there must be something quite exciting about pulling someone's business apart and figuring out the mechanics of it and then helping them grow it and build it and make it better. I mean, that's a really cool thing to be doing. Yeah, you know, we were looking at acquisitions and mergers for, for a little while yeah. last year. You know, we we focused on it. We bought a, 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 a home improvement company. Not our best acquisition, but our first time at that sort of thing. But I love getting into the details yeah, of the yeah. business, figuring out how they're working, how I'd make it better, where the synergies are, where, where you know where where you can advance it, where you can grow your sales synergies with our own business, and you know how how you could slash overhead, and you know I, I love that sort of stuff. So I can imagine that's quite an exciting part of of having these diverse customers that you can. Get. I mean, if you love business, then it's the best thing in the world. Yeah, I get to deal with loads of businesses, and yeah. not only that. I get to help people make a shitload of money from their businesses and I make money from that. Yeah. I'm like, what, did I win the lottery? Mm -hmm. Like for me, that's like, I can't think of anything better to do. Yeah. That for me is like what I enjoy and that's what I've pushed to. That's not for everyone. No. So figure out your thing. And um, I'm, I'm very lucky. I'm very yeah. lucky. No, and, and it's incredible. And obviously we are involved with Limitless University and, and you know, so far it's, it's been really great for us and, and the network and part of us has been a big deal as well. Um, really excited to see you know what you guys achieve with that going forward, and you know it, it's quite congruent with a lot of what we were trying to do on the property side of things, you know, and and build a community and helping people grow. And you have this transition of like up until a point, your life was all focused on getting achievement from what you've done, but when when it switches to having this massive sense of achievement from what you've helped someone else achieve in their life. You know, it, it can almost be more fulfilling. It's a really weird it's sensation. Way, really. Yeah. However, there's some lessons in life as, you know, we're both in the educational space. We both, you know, help people understand things more. We try and teach people things. 
there's some lessons in life you can't teach. And one of those typically is money isn't everything and actually helping more people is more fulfilling and more value giving yeah. than not. But you have to go and get rich, be successful, learn that mistake yourself. Yeah, yeah. And it's not necessarily a mistake. I think it's a I think it's it's a right of passage to get to the point where, okay, I've got all the materialistic stuff, mm. I've got the financial security, but more of it's not making me any marginally happier. So now actually when I help other people, I'm getting way more out of it. But you have to walk that path, I think, yourself. You do know nobody's gonna realise that, you know, when when you get a Lambo or a Porsche or whatever the nice shiny car is, that after a few months it's just gonna be a car that you get in every day and go work in and you know, it's it, it's short term fulfillment and understand and most people don't take the time to even understand the things that would make them happy in life because they're just driven by this day to day need to go work you know getting a little dopamine hits here here there from watching about a tv or, or on social media that they don't ever take the time out to say this is a life i've designed i can design whatever life i want to design for myself okay i'm gonna have to go out there and work fucking hard for it but you know i can change the game but most people don't even know what that different game would be or, or what that thing that would get them out of bed excited for every single day because they're so lost in the monotony of day to day that they never get that you know? the, the first trick is to actually realize that they are an npc you know when i say npc it's a non-player character someone yeah. that's got is in the system that's not even aware that they're not happy yeah that's the problem they haven't introspectively thought gone am i actually on a path that am i miserable mm -hmm. if so why yeah like th that doesn't even enter their heads because when those questions start to arise, you then what I class as a as a seeker. Mm. You suddenly realize that you're in this game, in this system, but you're not a player. Yes. And then you're seeking a way to become one. And that's where the you start seeking out networks and people like us that can actually help you get out over that. But it starts with realizing that there is actually a game to be played here. Yeah. And right now you're not playing it. It's it's you know, that's why the the, the whole matrix analogy is used so much because it's so incredibly accurate, you know, it isn't it? <laughs> It's, it's like you know, tell it's you waking up to the reality of what's yep. going on about you and, and most people are asleep you know? and it's, it really really pains me it makes yeah. me so sad yeah. because I wish everyone could experience what you and I get to experience yeah. on a daily basis mm. yeah um, I, I'm conscious of time yeah. uh, I could literally there's so many other uh, thoughts I had on, on conversation but this this has been a really good chat Elliot. The, I always finish the podcast with this same question of, of what what does real wealth mean to you real wealth real wealth is the ability to create change and impact for the net good so I think once you get to a point of self-fulfillment you then have the ability because talk, people talk about is people talk about opportunities. They talk about freedom, uh, what they can purchase with it. For me, wealth is the ability to give wealth, yeah, and that's ultimately what I'm striving for: to become wealthy enough in power, influence, money, to be able to impact the world in a really powerful way. Yeah, because that that's that's real wealth. Mm -hmm. That's real. It's, it's, it's so funny the the journey that you see time and time again play out with people that, that go on this this wealth trip of you know start and off looking for the shiny things, realizing quite quickly that that that's not going to fulfill them. You know, building purpose usually around the business and a drive and something that you really care about. But you know, creating wealth inadvertently through finding something you're passionate about you're building and then getting to a point where that business is at a stage and, and maybe taking a step away and then looking more altruistically at what you can do to the world then you know that that route plays out time and time again because you know ultimately we're we're human beings we're programmed there's there's a there's a design in there and that you know it's that maslow's hierarchy of needs mm -hmm. with with altruism coming at the end of it it's getting yourself to a point where you know, you've you've ticked off all this other stuff and, and you can say, right, how am I really going to help people in the world? The holy grail to being really, truly rich and successful mm -hmm. is to really give a fuck about other people. Yeah, I will be a billionaire, promise you that. I'll say on this podcast right now. Yeah. And it will be through helping an enormous amount of people. Yeah. Well, the more people you can help, the, the more... And with that money, I can do more help. But the shift in focus from ourself to others is what makes you truly rich. If you want to be truly, truly rich, yeah. stop looking at yourself. Look at others and you will act, it will come. But you got to have the vehicle to do it. I'm blessed that I've done this and I've gone through a lot of lessons at an early age. I'm 32 now. Yeah. Um, 
not long 32 and I'm in a position now where I know I've got another 50, 60 years I can keep going at this yeah. with this mindset already I think parking out but we're moving now mm -hmm. which is exciting as hell absolutely and I'm and I'm, I'm bringing other people younger people on this journey with me so I know that they can take over should they want later down the line so this is a, this is going to be a, an ongoing impact yeah I'm excited I'm excited for you and it's going to be incredible to see it you know we are we are we are We've got a journey ahead of ourselves. Five years in, I kind of feel like we're just moving now. Yep. But you know that's that's starting to get exciting now, and let's just hope with artificial intelligence and everything that's going to come, things are going to move very quickly, and uh, you know it's going to be interesting to see where we go. Um, Elliot, thanks a million. If if anybody is looking to reach out to you, check out more about Limit Limit uh, uh, Limitless University. I'll, I'll put the the link in the show notes anyway. But you know, do you want to see where 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 they yeah, follow you? Yeah, um, if you want to find me on Instagram or YouTube, just put Elliot Wise in. I'll come up. So cool. just put my name anywhere. Yeah, it's all good. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Absolute pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Cheers. 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 Thank you. This has been the Real Wealth Podcast. I'm Alex Robertson, and thanks for joining us on this wealth journey.